So these animal markets that uh, the virus has been connected to, they're actually, they're sort of treated in a, in a way like they're this ancient Chinese tradition, you know, this cultural longstanding institution, but they really only popped up in urban centers a few decades ago over sort of political and economic changes that were happening in China. So how certain are we about the animal market origin of SARS-CoV-2 and, and how loosely would that transfer occur? I mean, there's sort of this apocryphal tale that goes around of like a bat, you know, a bat guano and a pangolin, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, you also have a lot of blood transfer going on in these, in these markets, right? So you're skinning a pangolin for scales, for example, and you, you get some kind of spatter there or something like that. So, I mean, it, what are the different possibilities there, I guess is what I'm saying. Well, you know, th th it's a fantastic question. And, and you know, it, it does, you know, kind of harken back to, um, to my experiences with, with Ebola uh, in, in both West Africa and as well uh, as a researcher. Um, because again, we, we think, you know, with very high certainty that Ebola spilled over from bats and uh, that the likelihood is that um, food markets or game markets um, also play a, a big role in transmission. So where we are with- This, with this isn't just the China thing. Yeah, no, no. It's, and that, and it's, it, it's worldwide, right? Um, but of course, it, you know, China's in the spotlight right now with this. So what, what we know with SARS-CoV-2 is that the, the initial reports of emergence uh, on, on New Year's Eve um, basically looked at this you know, atypical pneumonia cluster that all happened to be in Wuhan and all had basically a relationship back to this one single animal market. Well, what we know now, you know, uh, and, and actually within about a month from that time period, we, we already knew that there were cases that predated um, uh, that cluster of, of folks that, that were at the animal market and actually happened or, or were identified in patients that had no contact with the animal market. So that doesn't necessarily take the animal market itself completely out of the equation. Um, what may have happened is there may have been some sort of an event where uh, somebody that may have been infected uh, with SARS-CoV-2 may have gone to the market and then basically amplified the transmission amongst people there. Um, so when we look at all the sequencing data, all the sequencing data so far suggests that this wasn't uh, a virus that was continually spilling over from, uh, from animal species, um, that the likelihood was that it spilled over uh, in, in a single event to humans, and then from there basically transmitted from human to human and was spread widely throughout China that way. So it, it argues against uh, this idea that, well, maybe there were just animals that were um, you know, acting as intermediate hosts that were taking that animal market and then passed it on. So, you know, I think we can kind of start to take a step back and say, okay, the likelihood is that event uh, at, at that single animal market is not the reasoning, um, but there likely was some sort of contact between humans and animals from which this spilled over. Now, was it something there's like- There's an animal trade and exotic animal trade that exists outside of just these animal markets that they're connected to. 100%, right? And, and we know that ultimately, um, listen, it, it doesn't require, or a lot of these viruses don't require a bat directly to come and bite a human to, to transfer the bat or to transfer the virus. Um, in a lot of cases, like you said, um, you know, it can be uh, basically the handling of a bat, um, you know, whether or not the, the bat is dead or alive. Um, if somebody has, you know, simple things like abrasions on their skin um, or has, you know, close contact with an animal and any biological fluids uh, spray into, into their face or enter in through a cut that could be enough to, uh, to basically mitigate transmission. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that's where we need to try and figure out uh, is, you know, what, what was the underlying event from which this occurred? And as well, are there other animal uh, intermediate hosts that may be playing a role in this? So was it, you know, rather than a bat directly to a human, was it a bat to another animal? And that animal was actually where there was human contact and through biological fluid or just direct handling, that virus transmitted. Yeah. So, I mean, and... So even despite the uncertainty about the animal market collect, uh, connection, I should say, there have been efforts to curb these, uh, you know, after decades, really, and, and, you know, them still existing between SARS and mm -hmm. it's kind of SARS-2 almost. There have been efforts to curb these, these animal markets, right? But if you were to outright ban them and so there are loopholes already that involve, you know, medicine, you know, scale mm -hmm. of penguins, that kind of thing. But if you were to outright ban these markets, the associated animal trade may not go away as much as go into a black market that pushes these markets out to the rural context. 
And that could make these outbreakers actually harder to control potentially. I mean, you have people coming from many different areas rather than concentrated in Wuhan. Does that sound sort of like it could present a problem? Absolutely. And, and we've seen these issues with, uh, with Central Africa and West Africa, right? Um, in most, uh, or in a lot of countries uh, in those regions where, where we've seen, again, you know, diseases like Ebola um, you know, transmitting, uh, what's happened is that uh, basically game markets or you know, what people commonly call bush meat markets um, uh, have, been, have been outlawed and are illegal. Well, the problem is that we know that those game markets still exist. Um, it's just that we don't necessarily, or the authorities don't necessarily know uh, for certain where they are and uh, essentially what, um, you know, what is being handled or, or what is being distributed um, at those markets. So there's, you know, it's a bit of a catch-22. I mean, you, you don't necessarily want to see um, things like live, live animal markets, um, uh, you know, providing the ability for, for people to be in contact with a lot of exotic animals. We, you know, in terms of animal welfare, there are you know, a litany of questions and ethical questions regarding them, and which I completely unabashedly agree with. My concern is, is that we also don't want to drive them underground so that it becomes much harder to track. Um, because ultimately, we, we know that there is a linkage between uh, emerging virus spillover and, and markets uh, such as these. Um, so driving them into, uh, into the underground uh, will make things a lot harder for us to track from a surveillance standpoint um, and from a pandemic preparedness standpoint uh, if that was to occur. No, I mean, and it's interesting in China, you have a very state, uh, a state oriented uh, policies in a, in a lot of respects, one could say, it, to, to euphemize it really. But at the same time, it's been quite some time and, and there's something embedded, even though these aren't longstanding cultural institutions that make it very hard to, to outright ban these animal markets. And, and then that, that black market problem also presents itself. So if these do end up remaining a perennial issue in some urban centers, in China or elsewhere, you know, mm. not to single them out, what kind of mitigating or regulatory measures could blunt the damage by a bit, at least, by making them yeah. maybe more hygienic if you, if you had inspections or something like that? Well, so that, that is a great point, Grant. And one of the things that, you know, we've discussed a lot with, uh, with African colleagues in both West and Central Africa um, is this idea, um, listen, we, we, can't, we can't go into different regions and say to people, you can't do this anymore. Um, because we know that from a cultural sensitivity standpoint, um, uh, we, we need to be more sensitive. Uh, but we also know that that, again, is going to uh, drive divides um, between authorities and between um, you know, other, uh, you know, other regions of the world uh, against one another. So we, that, that basically impedes what we're trying to do. I think from an educational standpoint, um, it requires us more going in and trying to figure out how to essentially mitigate those contacts. So is it as simple as trying to figure out how people are actually coming into contact with biological fluids, how they're handling the animals, um, providing some amount of uh, personal protective equipment, um, you know, for, for people that uh, that that may uh, you know potentially reduce exposures, or to be fair, for people that do have potential exposures, um, you know, provide them with uh, some sort of network where they can basically provide information that they were exposed or there was an exposure event, um, you know, without uh, concerns about repercussions. Uh, but also being provided with uh, with care and um, and diagnostic measures to uh, to look to see whether or not they they actually have been uh, infected with with anything. So I think trying to bring the public back into this um, is a critical point. We we need to build back um, public trust. So in order to think about these animal markets in a context that's broader than just singling out China or animal markets, are there any other agricultural practices around the world, including in the West, that appear to be incubating dangerous pathogens? I mean, I know antibiotic resistance is its own question there as well. Yeah, no, so th this is a great point, right? And actually, it's been one that's been, uh, been discussed uh, fairly readily um, you know, with uh, you know, the 2014 West African uh, Ebola epidemic onwards in regards to what are the major factors that are, are precipitating spillovers. Um, one of the things that people have been looking at fairly recently is this idea of uh, deforestation, right? So um, as basically we start to look at things like clear cutting, um, in particular within tropical regions where we know it's just a perfect environment for these viruses in terms of their reservoir hosts and the climate, um, it, are we basically putting humans in closer contact with animals uh, that, that they would not have come into contact with before and increasing the chance of spillovers? 
Now it's, it's easy enough to say, um, okay, well, if we just stop, if we just stop deforestation and and clear cutting, that that may actually um, reduce this. But what they've actually found is that even the type of uh, clear cutting actually has um, some linkage back to spillover events. So if people go in and if they've looked to see if they just broadly clear cut large sections of forest versus uh, basically going in and cutting out small pockets, what tended to happen was that there was more of a link uh, of spillover events to smaller pockets of deforestation as opposed to, to larger clear cutting. Um, so ultimately what I think it reflects back on is that there needs to be better planning um, in, in primarily in low and middle income regions, which are around the tropics, to try and, and help devise a strategy that, that is going to uh, reduce spillover events, in particular with bat populations uh, and rodent populations, which we know that you know, a large number of these emerging viruses are, are spilling over from. Yeah, and I mean, let's hope this is a wake-up call to, for global preparedness in terms of surge capacity at hospitals and, and in terms of uh, you know coronaviruses in general. I mean, it's an understudied Thing until all of a sudden this is now a big issue. So well, let's let's definitely hope so. Yeah, I, I agree completely. Uh, you know, Corona's listen. We we said after SARS that that they were a potential global pandemic threat. We know WHO a couple of years ago had classified them as such. Um, but you're right; they're they're understudied. And and I think what we're seeing is what happens when you have that one virus that spills over, where you have really no you know uh, pre-existing immunity uh, in the population. You have no vaccines and you have no therapeutics. Right. I mean, um, if, if flu just came out of nowhere today, I mean, there's all these comparisons made between COVID and, and flu, but that's kind of apples and oranges because yeah. I mean, if flu came out of no, like if influenza, all of a sudden, the first time we ever experienced influenza on mass pandemic scale was uh, 2020 AD, we would be just as overwhelmed. And that actually doesn't have to do with like, you know, what, for example, the fatality rate with flu is today, you know, with immunity, vaccination, mm. that kind of thing. But this is something with no global immunity. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So no, I, I think for us, it, it, you know, it really kind of embodies I think, what a lot of us have been arguing for for years with this idea of we, we have to look at these eventualities um, as, as actually being realistic. Um, it's not, yeah, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Yeah, and, and, and I agree. And, and listen, people have been screaming about this for, for decades. Um, hopefully, this is a wake-up call. Uh, you know, let's get through the pandemic. Um, but I think afterwards, it's going to be, uh, you know, a global effort and, and a country-by-country -country effort to try and revitalize how we look at pandemic preparedness. Re reflection, definitely necessary. Hey, we're running out of time. Uh, thank you so much for sitting down with me and talking to me. Uh, Dr. Kindertruck, always a pleasure. And thanks again. Great. Thanks, Grant. My best and keep well. You too.